I actually just woke up a few hours ago. So. Oh yeah. Wait, isn't it like 7.30 there in your country? Yeah, it is. Quick intro for those listening. This is the Successful Archie Students podcast, episode 39. I'm here with Christopher Johnson. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good. How about yourself, Kyle? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Thank you. So do you want to start off by telling us a bit about yourself and you know who, who you are and where you're from? Yeah, absolutely. So hello, everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I am from Ontario, Canada, and currently I actually just finished my third year of my undergraduate degree for architectural studies at Laurentian University's McEwen School of Architecture. Yeah, you've just finished your third year, um, at, you said at the Laurentian University in Canada, and you were mm-hmm. telling me in the emails you were sending me that this is a brand new school um, which just had its first grad class, I think it was last year. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like being a brand new school, there's been some up or downsides to your education so far. I think it's a bit of an up and down process because we're also in a way being, that says like a rat in a way, we're learning mm. things. They're trying to get us introduced to different things at the same time. It's a constant basis of trying to figure out what exactly they want to try and teach in their curriculum because we are also a tricultural mandate. So we're looking to also incorporate Aboriginal teachings as well as to incorporate the Francophone communities that are in Sudbury. So what do you reckon have been some of those ups or downs? Um, Have you felt that maybe some of the courses are not fully structured or maybe being a new school, there's been some positives to that? Well, for the original, with um, some of the previous graduates, I actually had the chance to talk with some of them and they see the evolution over the entire time that they've been in the school. And they see that the projects that they used to do are completely different than the ones that we used because it's, it's it's really weird. We have it to where some people are learning programs a lot later in their curriculum, whereas now we're having to teach it into our first and even second years of school now. So it's really just trying to balance everything as well as the studio courses. They're constantly being different. We had to wear in the second year studio before there used to be a canoe building. Now it's no longer that. And they had to where we built an actual wigwam on the main campus of Laurentian University. You're also a part of the... Uh, let me get this right. It was the Canadian Architecture Students Association, I believe, or the CASA, I think you called it. Um, yes, it can you is. tell us a bit about that and what does that actually involve? So, CASA is a student led nonprofit and bilingual organization that advocates for students as well, all across Canada for architecture. And some of the stuff that we do is try to profile and support these students in many ways by providing resources for them. An example of that would be to showcase their work on our website, as well as to also show, also bridge the gap between education as well as the profession. That's really cool. What did you find out about CASA or the CASA? (laughs) So when I first found out about it, it was actually through our local student association, also known as LASA or the Laurentian Architecture Student Association. Right. And basically, I actually started out as just a regular representative for the second year in my first year. And after that, I realized that they had a CASA rep there before. So I really wanted to try and get involved with that a bit more and learn about it. And I didn't realize how big it was until I actually started going to the meetings and everything, learning about it, and as well as it being a great opportunity for students to learn more about conferences and to get more involved with the community. So is that something you recommend other students do to join their local architecture groups or boards or something like this? I really think that a lot of students should take that opportunity because there are some things that a lot of students don't realize as soon as they get into that student association. You can branch off into many things. Like there are some people that will immediately go to being like president or vice president. There are some people that will just want to take a bit of a more backseat role instead, more so focus on actually contributing to their respective year. Or in my case, being a CASA rep, I would also be working on both the main, the local essay, as well as CASA. Wow. So what does that work involve for you? I guess being a rep, are you helping out first year students and stuff like that? Or What does that involve? With last year, at the time of me being on the local student association, it was more so me just helping out with the orientation events. So getting first year situated with it, as well as me actually going in and talking to some of the first years a bit more, I would actually see how they're doing. That would help them out, show them not to make the same mistakes that I did in first (laughs) year, quite a few that I did as well. So Mm. 
Uh, on that topic, do you want to talk through? Because I've got a question later, which is um, talking about some of the some of the mistakes that you've made as an architecture student. We all make them. I've made plenty of mistakes, but are there any that just stand out to you that you've just been like, "Oh, I wish I could have changed that when I was a first year or a second year student." Like, is there anything that just stands out to you? I think one of them would be the drive that I had going into first year, primarily, only because at first I didn't know what the idea of our, of architecture is. And that's one of the things that a lot of architecture schools in Canada have been doing. I've been teaching you more about the idea of how architecture is introduced. How do you design according to a community, to a climate, and to a client in particular who's going to be looking to purchase what exactly you're wanting to actually build. And yeah. it's a very interesting um, step for a lot of architecture students to take, as well as I'd say just learning the fundamentals of the skills, your craft as well being something that a lot of students struggle with early on. One of my biggest struggles I would have to say was actually model making because my hands are so flimsy. It's <laughs> ever that. I can relate to that. <laughs> so I'd like to ask, what made you choose architecture as a profession starting out? One of the things that I really looked back on as soon as I was getting into my second year of high school was actually where I was, I used to be like a little kid and everything. And we just went into a new neighborhood and it was just starting to be developed. I was actually out on my back deck watching the construction of multiple residential housing units being completed in that area as well as the park. So I really got to see the whole development going on right in front of me and around me. It was just incredible having that experience. So I really think looking back on my childhood was where I realized that I wanted to do architecture. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah, such a great privilege to have just growing up in in the built environment, I guess, because I lived in a well, kind of like an isolated house where I just didn't see any construction. We did some maybe a little bit of like renovation work and stuff, but nothing that could really benefit me in the long run of architecture. You've finished your third year. Is architecture what you expected? from when you were going into it compared to now? Like, is, is it what you expected? I'd say yes and no to some degree. I'd say yes, because it was all about me learning how to design these cool buildings, as well as just looking more into how I can actually contribute to the community, how I can actually design based on all of these parameters. And then to the flip side of that, I didn't realize how much I needed to learn on top of that because there's so much you need to learn and so much that you're trying to contribute at the same time to your studio classes, to your other classes, to your electives and so on and so forth. Yeah, because I'm a third year student as well. And I know that if I could go back, there's a whole lot of things I'd wish I'd do differently or wish I'd known. And I want to know, how about yourself, Chris? Because is there anything that you wish you could change if you were to start your degree from the start again? Or is there anything that you wish you had known? I think that at the start of it, it was definitely a challenge for me personally in terms of budgeting. That was probably the biggest thing for me because I didn't realize how much the materials were for actually purchasing an architecture, <laughs> trying to present them for the school and everything. It was such a huge shock because all of a sudden you have your regular uh, budgetary matters coming from your tuition and everything. And on top of that, I didn't even realize that I had to pay for all of these school supplies too until later in in the summer when I found out <laughs> a whole list of things to buy that they would come in the mail and everything as soon as I got up to school. Mm. That was one thing that was super challenging as well as just the whole studio atmosphere was just completely different than what I was normally used to in a classroom. Yeah, how so was it different? Say there was someone who's never studied architecture before. How do you think studio class is different to the normal classroom? In terms of the normal class, I'd say it's a lot more different because you can have it to where it's more one-on-one -on -one for a certain period of time compared to it just being generalized for the entire class and then you having to go in for help or when you needed to go for help in a certain subject or anything. In studio class, you could have that 15 minutes to talk to your prof about your project, then you can go outside of class time and also talk to them, email them and discuss what it is you want to do with your project. I want to dive back into the whole networking side of things that you were talking about with the CASA and how this has been, you know, getting you interacting with other students and probably teachers and all this. So do you have any tips for a student who's interested in networking 
with people in the industry or with other students or something like this? Is there anything that you could say to them? Absolutely. I'd say definitely put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to do it because there are a lot of students that don't take these opportunities. And as soon as they pass by, a lot of them take them for granted because they realize that they could have made all these different connections with different people across the world. And for me, being in CASA, I was actually able to go to what is known as the RAIC Festival. And the RAIC stands for the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Basically, it is another group that focuses on advocating for architecture all across Canada, as well as helps to figure out how exactly we do design for the built environment and also talk about the architectural language that we use and we speak to discuss a bit more about the actual networking as well as um, the REIC. But in terms of the festival, it's where you can also create different connections. I make connections with different architects from the States, from Canada, Australia. You get to meet them all over the place as well as meeting other students that are also going for the exact same thing as you. And it's really interesting just seeing that you make so many different connections all over the world, as well as me being able to talk with some people that are actually from the government in, in a sense. So it's also another opportunity for you to take advantage of. You can branch off in different places. So it's a lot of stuff that you can look into no matter where you go with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, that kind of got me thinking like, a lot of students are embarrassed or can be a bit shy when it comes to networking in person. I want to know, say you're at this festival and you you found an architect you want to go up to and you wanted to say hi or something. I want to know kind of what your approach is to that. Um, for someone who's not so confident and kind of just stands in the shadows for these events, what would you say to get someone out of their comfort zone and go talk to the people that um, would make a good connection with? I'd say one thing that you could do as well, this doesn't even have to be just in the middle of everything in between the conference. It could be after some of the actual little lectures that people do. You can actually go up to the speaker, say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I really appreciate what you've been doing and everything. I really think this is a great opportunity to work with you. And if you're ever looking for someone to be a part of your design team, it would be, I would so appreciate your consideration. It's something that I really think a lot of students don't realize is a lot of times when architects get these cover letters and resumes and their email to them, a lot of them say, dear so-and-so or dear human resources. It almost sounds like at the same time, it's coming across as it's just so professional. You need to let loose a little bit with it. And that's what some of these events do for you. They, they let you let loose a little bit. They allow you to talk to different people without having to be so in control but at the same time evaluate who who you're around and everything that's awesome great advice um i was definitely going to say something else on this topic um i can't remember exactly what it was so i'm going to move on to the next one but if i think of it i'll come back to it (laughs) absolutely i guess we sort of touched on this before but what do you think have been some of the most challenging things that you've faced as an architecture student some of the challenges that i faced that's a really good question i'd say Definitely learning a bit more about my time management in general. It's where you're having to balance so much schoolwork as well as outside another job that you would have. That's also what I had to do to deal with in my third year. I had five classes that were taking up so much time on top of a job and trying to pay for my school, my education, as well as for me being able to stay where I am today. Another challenge being just keeping up in general with everybody else around me. Because if at times it feels like you're far behind, but at the same time you're still far ahead because you have different skills compared to someone else and you keep judging yourself based off of them, which you cannot do, otherwise you're gonna fall even further behind. So you finish your third year. Does is that the end of your degree or it because I know at a lot of places in the country, oh, a lot of other countries, you've got a five-year bachelor and then you go to masters and stuff like this. But how does it work in Canada? So in Canada, there are some of them are a bit different. We At Laurentian, it is a four-year bachelor degree. And then after that, you have it to where it's a two-year master's degree. In other places, they have it to where you could go into an architecture program after being into an arts degree for, I think, three or four years. Right. And for those people that aren't in that aren't in architecture already for a bachelor's degree and going in for something completely different, they have the option to where it's a three-year degree. So the first year is getting you more introduced to architecture. 
And then the two years would be where you would have your master's in architecture. Yeah, you mentioned that you've been working at the same time as studying. And um, so have you finished your course and now being at the end of third year or are you still doing the master's or something? Or do you have the fourth year still as well? I still have the fourth year that I'm going to be going into come the fall. So that would be from September of 2020 to April of 2021. Right. And yeah, how have you found it? Um, trying to balance having a job and then also having this full-time study load. It is very, very difficult because you have to really keep in touch with how many hours of work you're really going to be working compared to the amount of schoolwork you need to do. One of the problems that I had starting out was around actually Christmas time where final projects were coming up and all of a sudden my work, because I was working at a catering company over, over that time, they had to where they had so many Christmas parties over the entire week. And I took a lot of those days to work when I feel like I should have been doing more schoolwork. <laughs> and it's hard to make that judgment at the same time, because you're also trying to live off of a certain budget. And sometimes you have to make those decisions based off of where you are in life. And for me, I needed to make that decision to help me live a bit longer. So those are some of the sacrifices you have to make with it, as long as it doesn't take away from your main schoolwork and how much you actually produce. Yeah, because I, I was the same, I guess, over Christmas time. This is when I work at Kmart. I don't know if you've got Kmart in Canada. Pretty much just a big retail store with all this different clothing and homewares and stuff, but mm -hmm. um, gets super busy over Christmas. And um, I'm a manager there, so my, um, my boss or whatever told me, um, oh, can you start working extra over Christmas once you finish uni and stuff? I'm like, sure. She hands me the new contract and it starts from like, I guess like six weeks before my big project was due and it's like full-time work. So I'm doing full-time work and full-time study at the same time. So I've got no time for myself. I'm just staying up to like just, just past midnight every night, just trying to get all my work done. And oh, man. I don't know. I kind of felt like having that balance of like just trying to hustle out work, then come home and just have this routine of study and work, but it kind of helped me in a way because I don't know, it just kind of gave me a bit more discipline when it came to doing my work rather than wasting the time I had because I only had a limited amount of time. I was spending that all on my projects and actually getting stuff done. So I think, yeah, I could just relate to you when you were talking about that. So I thought I'd share that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's definitely difficult to try and do it. And there's a lot of students who also just focus on schoolwork completely and don't actually have an outside job. And I commemorate them as well because they're looking to pursue their education as well and being that a primary factor. But as well as working, it's teaching you a bit more about how you use your time management and how exactly you go forward in life. Because no matter what you do in life, you're always going to be trying to keep a tab on how much time you have in each area of your life. And things are going to change constantly no matter what. So you have to adapt to those changes. That's such great advice. Wow. So I want to move on. What do you think is... This is kind of coming towards the end of this, but what do you think is the one thing that makes an architecture student successful? I asked this to pretty much everyone on the show and I get a whole bunch of different responses. So you can go wherever you want with this and just kind of have your own take on it. But what do you think is the one thing that makes an architecture student successful? One thing that makes an architecture student successful? That it's a is, very open-ended question. <laughs> Sorry. It is. There's so many different ways that you can go with it because... You, you could talk about all the networking stuff. You could talk about how some people always want to say, yes, you need these certain skills in order to succeed, but not everyone has those same set of skills set in stone. Like for me, especially, like I didn't come from someone who could just draw right off the bat. It doesn't have to be like that for everyone. There are people in the program who could be like artists. There are people who can do very great graphic designs. There are people that are amazing with software. I'd say for any architecture student, stick to your niche, but also make sure to improve on the skills that you may not necessarily have right now. Because in the future, those skills will be by far more necessary for you as well. One example of that I'd say is, um, say for example, you're applying to different firms as well outside of your education. And a lot of them are looking for different programs in general. So. One place is looking for Rhino as one of the main programs they use, or another one's looking for Revit and nothing else. Just as an example for it. When I was in school, one thing you do, don't limit yourself. Because if you limit yourself to only one thing, you're not necessarily going to get the full benefit of everything. 
And I had an experience with a prof where I was actually downloading Revit and our school mostly uses Rhino and Grasshopper. As soon as I was downloading Revit from my computer, one prof came up to me and said, why are you using Revit? You should be using Rhino because it's the primary thing. You could do so many different cool designs with it. Yeah. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, yes, I know that. But at the same time, there are so many places out there that primarily use Revit compared to Rhino. And that's mostly the case in Ontario. I applied to over 100 places and 10 of them came back to me saying, I really love the skills that you have, but what you need to do is focus on getting this software in particular, because this is what we primarily use, as well as most of the firms in Canada, in Ontario as well. So I'd say don't limit yourself to any number of things. Keep yourself open-minded and look for other alternatives if need be. Yeah, very well said. I think, yeah, it's that idea of diversification and just not having all your eggs in one basket because every firm is going to want something different. And if you're only spending your time on learning one particular set of programs or um, only trying to do stuff one particular way, then you're really going to be limiting yourself to a bunch of opportunities coming at you. So again, very great advice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome, man. So I'm going to hit you up with a bit of a um, a fire round, I guess, just a couple of quick, quick questions with quick answers. So who's your favorite architect if you have one? Oh boy, that is... I'm kind of torn a little bit because I love Louis Kahn and I also love David Shipperfield. Oh, okay, yeah. For both of them. One primarily using the frame views and everything to also show a bit more of the site and show the surrounding context. Whereas Louis Kahn, I love his use of natural light coming in. What is your favorite building? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, that's not an easy one. Every time I ask this, I'm like, it's going to be a quick answer, but no one has a quick answer for it. <laughs> All right. I'll say one that a lot of people might not necessarily know. I'm going to say the Nikmit Desert Cultural Center by Bruce Hayden. Right. It's basically one of the largest rammed earth walls in Canada. Wow. Okay. I'll have to get some pictures of that and put it on the screen. That sounds mm-hmm. interesting. Who designed that? Do you know? Or? Bruce Hayden. Okay. Awesome. And the last fire round question, I guess, is do you have a favorite architecture book or maybe a resource that you use for your education? There are so many architecture books out there that it's hard to choose one. <laughs> I actually have that um, the specifications book as well that gives all the details and everything revolving around different materials as well as um, building codes. That's a very useful book. Another one I have, I think it was something around something principles of architecture. It was a book I received back in high school after receiving technological design award upon graduation. And I actually got that book from MMMC Architects. That book I actually got upon my graduation because I had the highest distinguishable mark in my tech class. Wow. That's so cool. All right. Awesome. Well, I'll get to the last question, which is if someone wants to connect with you or find out more about you, what's the best way they can go about that? You on Instagram or LinkedIn or anything like that? I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram as well. Um, Chris.Johnson1404, if people want to talk to me over Instagram. I'm also on Facebook there, and um, I do have LinkedIn, and Indeed, if people are looking to connect with me in any way. That's awesome. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. I know you were just saying earlier before we started recording that you're working a 12-hour shift later or uh, earlier today, so I get you're a busy guy, especially because... Uh, you're an architecture student, so every architecture student super busy. I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on here, Kyle. And so last but not least, I wanted to say thank you to you guys for making it all the way through. You are the true champions. I just wanted to say if you found this video helpful, please do give it a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I post every couple of days, so if you don't want to miss out on these kind of videos, I've got another video coming out tomorrow night which is an hour-long interview with a sole practitioner and university coordinator and co-chair founder of a networking organization here in south australia so um definitely hit that subscribe button and the bell notification button because you don't want to miss out on that episode coming out tomorrow that's a little spoiler for you guys so thank you guys so much please do consider sharing this video with a friend and um take care enjoy the rest of your days